Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord this beautiful March, sunny Sunday? That was hard to say. Praise God. We're so blessed to have you here. We are so blessed to have you join us line. We're so glad to have all the way from PEI on a, on a little visit to us in Windsor, my nephew Matthew, his wife, and his two sons, Jackson and Quentin. We're so glad to have you folks with us this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And Matthew is preaching for us this morning and tonight. Trust that we're going to hear from God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful to be here today. We're thankful for your grace and mercy. That your will be done. That your will be accomplished. Move in this place as only, as only you can. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Jesus, it's Jesus. 
You may be seated. God bless you. Praise God. We're looking forward to our schedule. Tonight at 6 is prayer. 6.30 is our service. Wednesday at 7. And next Saturday, women, hear me now. Next Saturday, you have the morning off. You do not have to cook your husband or your son's breakfast and bring them to him while they're still in bed. Next Saturday morning, we're having a men's Fellowship breakfast here at the church for our local church. And uh, I forget what time it's at, but be here. Don't be late. 10. My wife just sent me 10. So 10 o'clock, men's breakfast next Saturday, just for local men. And Brother Matthew will be speaking to us again. We are looking forward to that. I love the scripture where Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't hesitate on his declaration of who he is neither do we hesitate in whom we're following we're following the way we're following the truth and we're following the life that leads us to eternal life thank god for that at this time our usher is going to come forward bring up our offering give us unto the lord thank you so much let's pray lord we're thankful for your grace and mercy today thankful for your bountiful blessings i pray you bless this congregation Bless those at home. Bless those, God, that are resting from their trips. I pray in Jesus' name. Praise God. Two more things. It's so great to have brothers and sisters all back and Jared back from Florida. Welcome home. Praise God. Welcome back. It's also good to see Brother Bijou Matthew. It's so good to see you here this morning. Praise God. That smile he has in his face is there for a reason. Him and his wife have been blessed with a beautiful little daughter. And we're so glad and we're praying for them in Jesus' name. Yes, let's, congratulations. Praise God. Praise God. The Lord is adding to the church. One baby at a time. Praise God. We rejoice with you, Brother Matthew. We're thankful. We're thankful for the blessing of God. Praise God. <laughs> greet your wife for us. And for the first time, I'm telling you this. Greet your daughter for us. In Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless. Let's worship as unto the Lord. There's only one God who reigns. And there's only one God who loves us. Only one worthy of praise. Jesus.
really have no other way. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. And no sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name. Let's worship him. He's worthy of praise. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Amen and amen. He is the way. Praise God. If you've lost your way, it's simple. He's the way. Praise God. You may be seated this morning. It is so good to have everybody here in the house of the Lord. You're dismissed. Benton from being our praise singer in training. Praise God. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. 
Thank you. Again, it's so great to have everybody here. It's great to have our young people home from Fredericton. They got home quite late last night or early this morning. And they're home today getting revived, going to come to church tonight, all excited. And uh, we're glad they had a safe trip to Fredericton and back. Seven people went down, seven people come back. That's a good sign. We appreciate that. Praise God. And it's so great to have my nephew, Matthew. Praise God. I could tell stories about Matthew. I've changed his diaper. Thank God. Not recently, but I have changed his diaper. Praise God. I fed him, burped him. He's puked on me. And it's great to have him here. Payback time. Come here. Praise God. He used to sit in his little jolly jumper. Remember that, Sister Sherry? He, for hours, he'd go back and forth, one foot to another foot. And all he'd go, hmm, 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 hmm. Back and forth. We'd be having tea and visiting. And Matthew would be, hmm, hmm, hmm. And just, can you still do that? Probably not. But we're glad that he's here and his wife and his children. This, is this your first time to Windsor, Jackson, Quinton? Is this your first time in Ontario? First time flying? Praise God. Maybe Ontario, where it's going to happen, you might have your first marriage and only marriage. We'll be here. You're, you guys are still single, right? Jackson, you're not saying you have a hook, fish on the hook there or something? Like, that we don't know. About? And it's great to have his wife, Jamie. And I told her last night she was going to sing. And uh, we had to use the paddles to get her going again. But they're going to take, take their liberty. Come on up, Brother Matthew. Take your liberty in Jesus' name. And you, you, you come up where you started and say, I'm glad to be in Windsor. Glad to be my uncle and aunt and stuff like that. And you said, oh, my wife's going to come and testify. So that's how you do it. Want to rehearse? Okay. I'm glad to be in Windsor. Glad to be with my uncle, Mark. He's my favorite uncle. He's the most handsome uncle in the family. He's the most smartest one in the family. And I'm glad to be with him today. That's your lines. Sister Jamie, come on up here and testify. God bless. Welcome to Windsor. <laughs> oh, praise God. It is so good to be with you all in Windsor today. Uh, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be here. And yes, it is our first time here with my two sons. My husband's been here a couple years ago. And we watch online occasionally and but now it's nice to actually see and be here and when we go back home and watch I can just imagine being here with you all. Um, Sister Chevry did mention that there were some French speaking individuals that watch online and that are here. Um, my French is not the best but I'll say a few words. Um, bonjour, salut tout le monde. Je suis content d'être ici avec vous autres, avec mes deux fils, mon mari qui était ici uh, deux années passées. Um, mon cœur est rempli ce matin d'être ici et d'un Dieu d'adoration. Ça, c'est pourquoi nous sommes ici, pour, pour lui. C'est tout pour lui. Et j'adore Dieu ce matin et je suis content que quand j'avais 15 ans, il voit que c'était moi qu'il veut dans l'église. Et j'étais juste 15 ans. Je ne savais rien de tout à propos de l'église, mais je suis ici et j'adore lui ce matin. So, Um, I just said that I was 15 years old when um, God reached down and pulled me out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon the rock, and I'm so glad. I'm so happy. I haven't looked back. Um, my two kids are here, my husband, and everything that we have, everything that we do is because of him, and I'm so happy and so grateful And I love him this morning. God bless. Amen. 
Amen. It's good to be back this morning, seeing a lot of uh, familiar faces. I don't see you. Is that going to fall? Oh, cool. I can hide stuff in here. Okay. I'm just going to be up front. I am on the tail end of battling a cold about two and a half, three weeks ago. I just got off a round of antibiotics for a uh, sinus infection. I got over that, and then last Sunday I woke up uh, with a cold and battled that all week, and I'm on the tail end of it, feeling pretty much better, but I do have a cough. I have chronic bronchitis, so basically whenever I get a cold, and even after the virus or the infection, whatever it is, is gone, my lungs basically constrict, and I cough and cough and cough, and it's annoying, so I might choke and cough, and I promise I'm not dying, but it is good to be back here in uh, Windsor, Ontario. Um, I, well, of course, I pray for my uncle and my Aunt Carol all the time. They're on my prayer list, and this church is on my prayer list, and uh, when I was here last time, an impact was made on me, and I'm so good this morning to see Ryman here, and uh, is Mike here? Mike, man, I remember seeing those two last time and their testimony of what God had brought them from and, you know, how they reached out. And uh, these two have been on my prayers, and I'm so proud of them. Because, you know, in, in this, this world that we live in, this generation, we're, we're getting further and further away from the things of God. God is becoming the opposite of what society wants. And so for young people, young men, or whoever, to, to seek that out, to seek truth out on their own. Not someone knocking on their door or working with them six months just to get them through the threshold of the church door, but for someone to say, hey, this is what the Bible says, and I've got to have it. That, that, that speaks volumes, because truth be told, that wouldn't have been me, um, and I was raised in this, and I more than a few times I've ran the opposite way like a fat kid after cake. I have ran. I have chased. I've pursued the opposite of what is godly and holy. But I'm glad to be with you all here today. And um, I don't even remember how long I preached last time. I don't even remember what I... 36 minutes. Okay. Uh, right. Well, I'll put it this way. I am not a long-winded preacher. I might be five minutes. I might be 15 minutes. If I go over 30 minutes, the only way that's going to happen if the Holy Ghost takes over the service. I'm open to it. Please, Lord, do it if you want to do it. But otherwise, I'm not a long-winded speaker. So when I was praying, I was, Lord, what do I say to these people? And I was looking for some elaborate thought. And, and I have, I've had a revelation that, Lord, we, we, we people, we like to hear Thoughts that, 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 you know, make us ponder and think and phrases and teachings and truths that just blow our minds and that make us think. And we want them, the, the preacher to get up there and to say things and, and that just, oh, that felt good. I'm so, you know, the preacher, he, he, you know, he said some awesome things this morning and with a vocabulary, you know, my brother, he's got a background in Hebrew and Greek and he teaches at Northeast Christian College and original transcripts of the Bible, and, and my extent is um, C-spot run. I am very, very lowbrow. I'm very short with my words, but my prayer with my preaching is, God, let my preaching be simple in nature, but that, Lord, as long as it's anointed, Lord, as long as I'm saying what you want me to say, so, Lord, what can I possibly say to these people that their pastor could not say? What can I say to these people? What can, Lord, what could I bring to the table that someone from a neighboring church, another pastor that you couldn't put in their heart to come say? And when God talked to me, he reminded me of some things. And this morning I'm going to talk to you on the thought of in the pursuit of purpose. You know, you can come to church your whole life. You can even be claimed to be a Christian. You, you can go down in the waters in the name of Jesus. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost, and you can talk in tongues. 
And you can come to church, and as long as there's a congregation, a people, a sense of community, you can get lost in that. You can melt into that. You can blend into it like a chameleon. You can just fade into the background and exist, never knowing your purpose. Now, I'm not talking a purpose like living for God and being a Christian, you know, having a prayer life and having a time of, with God and having a consistent walk with God and you know, reading your Word. I'm not talking about that. But if you're to take away everything, now, I'm a pastor, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm an uncle, not a very good looking one, but I'm an uncle. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a brother, I'm a nephew, I'm a fisherman. I don't own the boat or else I would have flown up here first class. I don't own the boat, but I work on a fishing boat. All these things, if I was to strip away, take away the mantle of husband, take away the mantle of father, take away the mantle uh, of you know, husband and nephew and, uh, and all these things, and then we get down to it, okay, now let's take away the mantle of preacher. Let's just say the government ships me off to an island somewhere. Becoming a Christian is now illegal, and they ship me off to an island, and I don't have a congregation anymore. I don't have anyone's life that I can preach into. What then have I become? Uh, you all need to ask yourself this morning. Take away all these things, and what are you? What's your purpose? What drives you? Listen, we need to get a hold of our purpose. We cannot just come to church because it feels good. We need to understand our purpose. Uh, you need to come to church and understand where you fit into the body. Listen, if you're meant to be a hand and you come to church trying to be the mouthpiece, you're, you're going to throw a wrench in the operation and things are going to begin to fall and get out of sorts. This morning, the Scripture up, I want to go to very briefly is Isaiah 40 and 31 where it says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And Matthew 6 and 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Understanding your purpose. Some people like to be self-appointed. Well, I'm this because I say I am. I remember not too long ago, I was sitting around with some other Christians, some other saints of God. And we were sitting around a table at, uh, <coughs> excuse me, at camp meeting of some sort, and we, we knew them somewhat. We were talking. I wasn't pouring on all my problems, but I was going through it, and we were talking about how hard things were getting and all this. And someone said, well, why don't you just take six months off, go to a church somewhere. That's what we did. Go to a church somewhere where you can just be fed. Do that for six months until you feel better. I said, how can I do that? I, di I didn't know that was an option. Can we do that? Can we just hightail it for six months? Could you imagine your pastor gets fed up and stressed out if he said, folks, I'll be back in six months. I'll be ready to preach. I'll be ready to talk to you. But give me six months. i got to take a break. I said, yeah, I get tired and I get weary, but I am called to be a pastor in Surrey PEI. Listen, there might be times I, I, I got to go through things. And listen, when I let my flesh into the equation, that's where I start to say and I get concerned and I say, God, why am I here? Why am I pastoring a little church in St. Catherine's Road, Surrey PEI, not even in the town, in this little church building that's falling apart in a church with just a few people holding on hoping and praying for revival, holding on to promises that were preached over this church and given to us 40 years ago. God, what am I doing here? When I let my flesh and my will into the equation, that's when I begin to question my purpose. That's when I begin to question the things of God and say, God, what am I doing here? God, why have you... God, it feels like you've forsaken me. You know, I love that in the Scripture, and I, I have this weird mental analogy years ago in the Bible where it says, and God remembered Noah. When Noah, they've been floating around you know, for four days and four nights, they've been floating around in that boat and said, God remembered Noah. I had this mental that God was standing doing the dishes, and he forgot Noah floating in the sink, and the sink was starting to overflow, and said, and God remembered Noah. <laughs> right over to get, turn the sink off. 
I feel like God has put me there a few times when I let my flesh into the equation. But when I get a hold of it and I get over myself, and I get back to praying, and I get back to reading the Word of God, and I get out into a place of prayer, and I say, God, what am I doing here? And I let God speak into my life. Uh, I remember God's called me here. And it doesn't matter if there's no church. It doesn't matter if there's no people. If every single person in our church, if they die off or they backslide, walk away, whatever the case may be, God's called me to this town to keep the light on in the lighthouse uh, and to send, to preach the word of God uh, and to stand on the word of God. Because somewhere along the line, God got a hold of me. I've ran from the will of God so many times. When I got, you know, when uh, there was a time early in my, in my life uh, after my wife and I got married, I ran from the call of God. I knew there was a call of God in my life. Uh, and I'm sorry, excuse me if I told this last time I was here. But I ran from the call of God. It wasn't that I hated God and I didn't want to live for God. But I couldn't handle the weight of that mantle on my shoulders. I was so ashamed of the man that I had become. I wanted nothing to do with the purpose that God had put in my heart and in my soul. And I ran from the things of God. And I remember that very first year I found myself on the back of a fishing boat up 3.30 every morning. You never knew which way the wind was going to blow. And more than one day, more than a few days, I lost my lunch over the side of that boat. I remember saying, God, I'm so sick and tired of doing it my way. I'm so sick and tired of not knowing what you want me to do. And every morning I would get up and I was so tired and I was so desperate. I said, okay, God, whatever you want me to do. And on the back of that fishing boat, uh, my captain at the front, his wife over in the side, grading lobsters. I'll never forget the spirit of the of God, uh, the Holy Ghost sweeping over that boat and dry, pulling me back to my purpose. Church, if you understand your purpose, if you know what God's called you to do, if you know where you stand on the Word of God, you'll never be able to walk away. The devil and life itself will never be able to rob you of the truth and that will be able to rob you of the gospel. Now look, you may not be called to stand behind a pulpit. You may be called to stand at the back of the church like Brother Moss and to shake their hand and the Holy Ghost and the love of God pour off you. Now, I love Brother Moss. I don't know him that well, but I love that man. I tell Mark all the time, he's your Lenny. Lenny Macbeth is my uncle and from Ripples, New Brunswick. And uh, my aunt, his wife, passed away <clears throat> Excuse me. Last spring, and now they're faithful. Never, they, you know, they're the kind of people that that it, it doesn't matter. They're behind the pastor 110. percent Never, 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 never sat down, you know, and taught taught a series. Never stepped foot in the mission field, but they, you know, upheld the pastor in prayer like stone pillars. Brother Moss, if you ever want to come to Surrey PEI, Sister Moss, I'll find you a place. And last spring, when my aunt, or sorry, it was before that, she was diagnosed with, I think it was pancreatic cancer. And uh, so we didn't think we were going to be able to be there for the funeral with fishing season, everything turning up. That's how it works in the Maritimes. We have really slack winters. Then spring, summer, it's full tilt. So my mother and I made our way over to just spend time with them. And I remember when we went in the, the hospital room that afternoon, to talk to Shirley. And we made our way into that cancer ward. And uh, when I, we went in, and Lenny was with his daughter in, in the corner, and I saw my cousins, and Shirley was lying on that bed, and there was soil linen and full of garbage bags under the bed. She was in so much pain. And again, this is a woman, never stepped foot in the mission field, but she was the artillery for the missionaries. Three o'clock in the morning, if the Holy Ghost wrestled with her, pray, man, prayer warrior. She wasn't the kind, you know, the flashy evangelist that gets all the attention, but faithful. And we went and talking to her, and we're praying before we got to pray. And uh, here's this woman. 
And she said, I wish I'd been more faithful. (gasps) I almost lost it standing at that hospital bed. If this woman's going to question her faithfulness, I made my faith feel like it was a little dust of sand in the wind. I felt so like, oh, my word. And then we prayed with her. I remember we laid hands on her. We prayed with her. And the Holy Ghost swept in that room. We almost had a blowout revival in that room. The Holy Ghost was so thick, and the tears were running down her face, and she worshiped God. And you know what? She didn't even pray for herself. Oh, Lord, please heal me. You know what she did? She cried out for her sons and her daughter that had walked away from God. She called out for her grandchildren that didn't know Jesus. She called out for her legacy. She called out God. I remember I, I, I spoke the Holy Ghost, stirred the gift of the prophetic in me. And I prayed, and I felt the words come to the forefront. And I said, God, Lord, remember her prayers and let them burst forward. Oh, God, remember all the prayers she's prayed for her kids. Lord, remember the prayers she's prayed for her, her, her grandchildren and her friends, that community, that small little community ripples. She knew her purpose. And even looking at death in the face, she didn't plead for her own life. She knew her purpose. And she didn't yearn, oh, I'm called to be this. She never scuffled with the pastor. I don't like what you said about tithing. I don't like what you said about hair. I don't like what you said about this. I don't like what you said about that. No. She stood behind the pastor. And she prayed. And she she poured out her spirit every Sunday. every, Every day they would pour their spirit. They knew their purpose in the body. Church, when we find our purpose when you understand where you belong in the wheel. Listen, there's nothing glorious about the ministry. If God hasn't called you to stand behind the pulpit, it probably means you're not quite insane. My brother and I had a discussion. It seems God only calls the mentally challenged to stand behind a pulpit because we're the only ones crazy enough to do it. Church, when you understand your purpose and the calling that God has on your life. And like I said, if your calling is to go and teach a Sunday school class to some children and to teach them that God loves them, that Jesus died for them, and that no, it doesn't matter what situation they got to go home to, that Jesus loves them, and to teach them about the garden and Adam and Eve, and to teach them about Abraham, father of the faith, and to teach them about Moses and Noah, to teach them about Peter and Mark and Luke and Timothy, to teach them about Paul, to teach them about the Gospels. Hey, if that's your purpose, get behind it. Uh, Run with the calling that God has put in your life. Uh, If your calling is to stand behind a keyboard or a drum set uh, and to play every Sunday, every service, if that's the calling that God has put upon you, is to lead in worship, don't just show up to practice once a week. Don't just show up what are we singing this Sunday? Okay. No. A hey, Monday morning rolls around. You find yourself a place to pray. You take some time, not just to pray and to fast and say, God, uh, Lord, remember my needs today. Remember my health. Uh, remember my loved ones. You get to praying and fasting. Intercede for the worship service. Intercede. God, what do we sing? Lord, what do you want to hear? Lord, that when they walk through the doors, oh God, and if it's something that, Lord, something that just sang at general conference, or if it's amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Lord, let the anointing rest upon us. Worship team, if that's what God has called you to do, pray and fast that you know exactly what to sing. That they look, I've heard so many young people and people that you know that are gifted musically and they can sing and they can play and it's so dry not a heart is stirred and then I have on more than one occasion I've seen a few little old ladies (coughs) sound like cats on chalkboards their voices are they're aged but they get up behind the piano and their, their fingers begin to just glide across the, those keys. And then I've seen the glory of the Lord come down like a great fist on that congregation. And then sinners come to the front, forget the altar call, make their ways to the front and repent and say, God, I need you. That's the power. 
power of understanding your purpose. If God's called you to say, Pastor, do you want me to clean the church? Do we need to set up a schedule for this? I'll, I'll, I'll clean toilets. I just want to serve. Hey, that was one of the starting points in my ministry. When God was really getting a hold of me in Bible college, when I was really praying and fasting, you know what God did? He didn't give me some elaborate sermon. Lester Mitchell was the campus pastor. You know what God told me to do? Go tell that man, is there anything I can do? You know what Brother Mitchell said? Yeah, go clean my car. Go mop the floors. And I did it. And then when I did go out on weekend ministry in Bible school, when I had the opportunity to preach, the anointing was there because my purpose wasn't to be seen and heard behind a pulpit. My purpose was, God, whatever you want me to do, whatever you need me to do, God, get a hold of me. God, I'll go with it. God, lead me. Oh, God, do you think David, before he was a king, when he was sitting in a field playing unto the Lord and worshiping the Lord and for gotten even when the prophet visited the house and looked over all those brothers and David was in a field just God Lord I love you Lord you're so faithful Lord you're so holy Jesus well, I guess they didn't know Jesus back then they didn't know the name of Jesus at that point but you know what I'm saying you're so lovely you're so awesome Lord the, 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 the earth is your footstool you're so high and mighty oh God I worship you and I exalt you do you think at that point in time he said, Lord, make me king or else. No, he lost himself and said, God, if this is my job, if this is my job, be forgotten and stand in a field and watch over my father's flock, I'll do it and I'll worship you anyhow. We need to understand our purpose. And if you walk with your purpose, if you live your purpose and don't walk away from it, I was talking to my cousin Jordan <coughs> yesterday, and we were talking, and he's living my dream job. He's living my dream job. When I was young, I didn't want to be a preacher. I was pretty young when I knew God was starting to call me. I wanted to either be in the military, or I wanted to be the police, or do one, then fall into the other. I wanted to, that, that's where I wanted to go. So when I talk to Jordan, I get a little jealous. And when I remember when I was running from the ministry before I got into fishing, at least I had the sense to listen to this much, I remember I got into basic training. And all the warning signs were there not to go. And then after a while, there was this release. I felt like, oh, okay. And I remember I joined the Army, and I was going to be a combat engineer. And then I was eventually going to, I wanted to be a combat diver. All these things I wanted to do. I was physically fit then. And I, I, was, I was ready for it. I loved it. I was so ready. And I remember I was barely two, three days, if that, into training. And I remember thinking, it was like I was, my feet were being dangled over hellfire. I knew I had made a critical mistake. And so I had to sign a voluntary release. I had to go through that personal humiliation of being voluntary released from the military, but at least, and then eventually God got a hold of me in fishing season and all that, that followed. But I was doing what I wanted to do. This was my dream. And the moment God let me walk through that door, God gave me permission. God will let you, sometimes he'll let you walk through the door of your own choosing. And like a looney tune, you'll step on a rake and thunk. I, and I remember feeling like I was so miserable. I was so depressed. I was like, this is, and it took five or six weeks before you could even get out. We need to understand, listen, what God has for you might be so simple. It might, maybe God's calling you to stand behind a pulpit and preach. Maybe God's calling you to a mission field. Maybe God's calling you to do something around your local church. Whatever it is, do not walk away from it. First and foremost, everyone's purpose is to know him. Everyone's purpose is to know him, is to go into the waters of baptism in Jesus' name to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But I'm not going to touch on too much on that this morning. 
Everyone has a purpose in the church. And where problems begin to happen in the church is where someone else gets jealous of another's position. And they say, oh, I want that. That looks fun. That looks good. Oh, I'd be so much better than that. I sing better than sister such and such. I do that better than brother so and so. I could preach. I could teach. I could pastor better than the pastor. I could do this. I could do a better job at that. I want to do this. I want to do that. I, I want to do this. Or you know what? Maybe I want to go to a different church. I want to go to a church where there's lights and, and they, have a, they have a corral. They have, they have all the lights and the pizzazz and, and the pastor never makes me feel bad about the dumb things that I'm doing. I want to go where the pastor doesn't preach Holy Ghost conviction. I want to go where I feel comfortable rather than saying, God, where do you want me to go? Lord, where do you want me to stand? Lord, what do you have in store for me? Lord, what do I got to do? Lord Jesus, you've been so faithful listen we serve such a god who's so faithful who doesn't just take us part of the way and drops us off the mat off the map sorry but if we put our trust in him if we put our faith in him and we line ourselves with his purpose he doesn't just drop us off the map he doesn't just leave us where we you know and just out in the wind my wife and I are so blessed. My wife and I, we, 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 no, we don't have riches. We don't have a lot of money. But in our yard, we've got two cars. We've got the home that I grew up in and never dreamed that I ever live in it again. All the stuff and the extras that I have in my life. I say this to my church so often. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense all the things that I have and that we know we serve a God who gives and he takes away all the stuff, all the extras God has blessed me with. But I, but I am convinced it is because when I made that decision, okay, God, I'm done chasing after my own dreams. God, I'll be like Joseph, and I'll go after yours. God, I'll go after what you've designed for me. I'll go where you want me to go. And after that, God has put into my life time and time and time again. Because if you get stuff that the world gives you, it will begin to have a bitter taste in your mouth. It'll crumble. It'll fall. But if God puts a blessing in your life, the world cannot take it. If God, no, I'm I'm getting material here, but excuse me. If God, and he does, he can and he does, if God blesses you with a car, that doesn't mean you're not going to have problems, all that stuff. The world, the devil, cannot take that. But if you step outside the will of God, and go after six-figure, whatever job, you make buckets of money, and you purchase all the toys you want, the world can take it. Because you've gotten that through going against what God has set for you. But if God's called you to in some backwoods community, your church is 45 minutes away, Nothing but old people still singing, come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. That's new to my church in Surrey. We just learned that. If that's where God has called you to fulfill a purpose, you will be content. You will be happy. You will be blessed. Your salvation will never be called into question. If you stay in your purpose and you stay where God, in that, that lane that God has purposed for you, you'll have liberty when the song service starts. Uh, as long as you're doing what God has purposed you, there's nothing more sad than seeing someone come to church saying they're a Christian and those songs come on and the anointing's there and their hands are down here and their head's at the floor. But if you walk where God wants you to walk, uh, there's liberty in the Holy Ghost. You'll have liberty to walk in the Spirit. You'll be happy. You'll be content. Praise the Lord. I am so glad we serve a God who is faithful. I like to think of Jacob, who... If we look at the characteristics of Jacob, he wasn't a very good man the first part of his life. He lied to his brother, stole a blessing, toiled and worked for one wife, got the wrong one, worked another seven years for the right one. 
<laughs> no, thank you. I don't even have any hair as it is. Anyways, he toiled all these years, and on his way back, thinking he was going to meet certain doom, he wrestles with the angel of the Lord, and he surrenders to a purpose. He surrenders to what God wants him to do. And God not only changed his course, but he changed his name. God changed his identity. He was no longer that old guy. He was now this guy. He was no longer that guy. You see, since I've aligned myself and submitted to the will of God, I'm no longer who I was. My brother has made fun of me on multiple occasions. And I'm closing. How long have I been? Did I make it record time? No, stink. I'm closing now. Music, why don't you want to come back? My brother has made fun of me on several occasions. He's a pastor in St. John's, Newfoundland. He's made fun of me. He said, oh, you know, my, everyone likes to say, you know, my brother is definitely the emotional one because sometimes I do get very emotional when I preach. But what they don't understand is before I let God take control of my life and surrendered, they don't understand how hateful I was. They don't understand how violent I wanted to be. They don't understand that bitterness that weighed me down every morning, just being uncontent. But when I surrender to the will of God and say, okay, God, I'm ready. Okay, God, I'm done running. Okay, God, I surrender. Okay, God, if you want me to preach, fine, I'll preach. God, if you want me to pray for people, fine, I'll, I'll do it. God, whatever it is, I'm done running. And when I did that bitterness, that anger, it, it melted out of my heart. It melted out of my soul. And God replaced it with compassion that wasn't there. He replaced it with a, a kindness that wasn't there. That when I get up behind the pulpit, and I don't know what's going on in each and every one of your lives, but I see struggles and I see decisions. I see places and spiritual places and mindsets I used to have. I get touched in my soul because I know that, hey, you know what? If you let Jesus take control, if you surrender and say, God, my way it leads to ashes and dust. But Lord, your purpose is higher. Your way is better. Lord, your thoughts are are not our thoughts. Uh, Jesus, your way is holy. Lord, you're awesome. You, you, you're a holy God. You're a separate God. Jesus, I want what you want for my family. I want what you want for my wife and kids. I want what you want for my career, for my ministry. I want what you want for my town. Not what I want. Lord, I want what you want. I'm done chasing and you know what? Even when I was running from what God wanted me to do, I wasn't just like smoking cigarettes and drinking and out, you know, sleeping around, all these things. I wasn't lost in sin. But I was running. I could come to a Pentecostal service where they'd be running, jumping and shouting, and I could blend in. I knew how to blend in. But in my heart, my soul wasn't there. This world will tell you, oh, just follow your heart. I turned my notes off. It leaves in Jeremiah. It says, the heart is deceitful above all else. Do not listen to your heart. The world, musicians, they over and over again, just listen to your heart. You want to know who to love, who to marry, who to mess around with? Oh, just listen to your heart. Want to know where you want to go in life? Listen to your heart. That's not what the Word of God says, and the Word of God is final. It is, it is final. The Word of God says to wait on Him. The Word of God says if you put me first, if you seek me first, I'll add the rest. The Word of God says if you put me first, and if you teach your kids to love me. I know I said I was closing. Sorry, preachers, we like to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm stopping soon, I promise. You know what? I love to see. Now, Jordan and I, we grew up brothers pretty much. You know what? I saw this morning, I saw little Benton sitting there with that microphone and his hands up. He was mimicking what he saw. 
And you know, I begin to see, I saw some purpose stirring. He may not understood really the depth of what that little boy was doing, but I saw some purpose falling on him. I saw something stirring in his heart. If we put purpose into our kids that, hey, your grades, whatever, they might go up and down, but teach your kids that first and foremost, we live for God. We seek God first. Hey, everything else falls into line. Let's all stand this morning. There are preachers here this morning who have not yet to pick up that mantle. There are altar workers here that have not picked up that mantle. You know what? Sometimes God gives us extra. I won't say what it was, but after my uncle Aubrey McAllister died, he supported missions a certain way. I'm not going to try to think of how I can get around some wording. After he died, he supported missions a certain way. I never thought of this in a million ways. And then one night, I remember having a dream. I was walking along, and Aubrey was walking. He was walking towards these gates. And there was a mantle on the ground. And I stooped over, and I picked it up and threw it on my shoulder and kept going. I picked up that mantle. Listen, if God has put something in your heart, I promise you, you can never outgive God. You can never outlive, outlove God. You can never do more than God cannot return to you. I feel the Holy Ghost. There's something, there's some callings going out this morning. Maybe some that stand behind a pulpit. Maybe some that just they don't have a lot of glory, but I guarantee you, you, you give yourself to those callings, you're gonna feel an anointing that wasn't there. Amen. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. And take my hands, Lord, take my feet. And touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. And take my hands, Lord, take my feet. And touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. And take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Jesus, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet, and touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me.
Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I appreciate the word of the Lord this morning. Praise God. 
Praise God. Find your purpose. Find your purpose. Find your purpose. Fulfill your purpose. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the house of sinners. I'd rather back in this church and go to heaven than be a multi-millionaire and lose up with God. I'd rather clean the toilets of the church than have my name written in Hollywood on the walk of fame. Your purpose and my purpose is this, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That is your purpose. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody take you from your purpose. You'll regret it. You'll regret it. We only get one kick of the can. I don't believe in reincarnation. It is appointed a man once to die and then the judgment. So don't say, well, I'll serve God better in the next life. There is no next life. This is it. This is the only show playing. Don't end your life with regrets. But end it with, I've done your will, God. I've done your will. Find your purpose. In Jesus' name. Praise God. We're going to leave here this morning with a message from God. God's calling us. What brought me through my stupidity of being a young person was a call of God that came on my life when I was nine years old, a little kid. And that propelled me through life, the darkness and the valleys I went into. It also helped me in making my career decision. I could have been a cop, could have been a school teacher, could have been something else. But that call kept calling me. Kept calling me. You're not called to be a cop. You're not called to be a school teacher. You're called to be a preacher. And I'm thankful that I answered the call of God. You mightn't be, but I'm thankful. Praise God. God bless your pee picking heart. Tonight, prayer at 6. Serves at 6.30. Let's have church tonight. Let's pull up the stops. And let's have church tonight. In Jesus' name. Lord, we're so thankful. We are so thankful for your grace. We're so thankful for your mercy. And God, we're so thankful for your calling. And we've responded to your call, seeking our, your purpose for our life. Help us to put you first. In Jesus' name. Bless this people. In Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.